Hello everyone, today we're visiting the incredible world of spirulina farming, where modern technology meets sustainability in an exciting aquatic farming environment, all within the controlled space of a greenhouse. Spirulina, a blue-green algae, has been used for centuries by the Aztecs and African communities. Rediscovered in the 20th century, it's now known for its protein, vitamins and antioxidants. Today, it's farmed with modern technology in controlled aquatic farms, making it a popular ingredient in supplements and wellness products worldwide. We'll take you step by step through the process of cultivating and harvesting spirulina, highlighting the advanced technology that makes it possible. Whether you're curious about innovative farming techniques or looking to learn more about spirulina cultivation, this video is for you. Spirulina farming is done mainly in two methods, open ponds or indoor greenhouses. In pond farming, spirulina is exposed to weather and other outside factors, making it harder to control growth and less efficient. Greenhouse farming offers a more controlled environment where spirulina grows best with consistent light, temperature and pH levels. This makes greenhouse farming a more reliable and effective option. Let's start with the cultivation process. Before starting spirulina cultivation, the first important step is preparing the nutrient solution. This means mixing purified water with organic fertilizers to create a nutrient-rich base. Spirulina needs the right balance of key nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium to thrive. These nutrients help it grow quickly and stay healthy, which leads to better harvests in the long run. These days, algae bioreactors or photobioreactor are becoming a popular choice for growing algae like spirulina. They're basically controlled systems that create the perfect environment for algae to thrive. By regulating things like light, temperature, pH and nutrient levels, bioreactors help optimize spirulina growth while keeping contamination at a minimum. Plus, they're great for the environment. Many of these systems capture CO2 emissions from waste, boosting spirulina production and contributing to sustainability efforts at the same time. Then the next step, inoculation, is the stage where spirulina cultivation officially begins. Once the nutrient solution is prepared with purified water and essential nutrients, the next step is to add a spirulina starter culture. This culture contains live spirulina cells, which are introduced into the nutrient-rich solution. This marks the beginning of the cultivation process, as the spirulina begins absorbing the nutrients. This is where the magic starts. As the cells multiply, you can start to see the water change color as the spirulina begins to thrive and grow. This is the crucial turning point where the cultivation process comes to life. Creating the perfect growth environment is key for spirulina to thrive, and that's where the photobioreactor comes in. It all starts with light, Spirulina needs proper light each day. The photobioreactor provides it by energy-efficient LEDs that mimic sunlight while offering more consistent coverage. An adequate temperature between 20 degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Celsius is also maintained to keep the spirulina growing without stress. Adding carbon dioxide helps maintain pH, which promotes healthy growth and nutrient absorption. These controlled conditions not only replicate spirulina's natural habitat, but also use modern technology to boost growth and production efficiently. Monitoring growth is essential in spirulina cultivation to ensure the microalgae thrive in optimal conditions, leading to better yields and a healthy culture. Regularly checking and adjusting certain factors is key to maximizing production. Keeping the right pH levels is super important for spirulina to grow well. Spirulina loves an alkaline environment, ideally with a pH between 8.5 and 9.5. Regular checks with pH meters or test kits make sure everything stays within this range. If the pH drops too low, substances like sodium bicarbonate are added to raise it, and if it goes too high, a bit of hydrochloric acid can bring it back down. This balance ensures that nutrients are available for spirulina to grow properly. Temperature is another big factor. Spirulina thrives in water between 20 degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Celsius, so sensors are used to constantly monitor the water temperature. If it gets too hot, cooling systems or shade can help bring it down, and if it's too cold, heating systems are used to keep things stable. Keeping the water temperature just right 
means less stress on the spirulina, which leads to better growth. Nutrient levels are also key to healthy spirulina. It needs nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to grow strong. Regular testing with sensors helps keep an eye on these levels, and if nutrients are low, fertilizers are added, but care is taken not to overdo it, as too much fertilizer can throw off the balance and affect growth. Light plays a major role in spirulina's photosynthesis, so it's important to get the right amount of light. Light is another crucial factor for spirulina's growth. It needs about 16 hours of light each day. Light meters are used to check how much light is hitting the water. If it's not enough, additional lighting or reflective surfaces are used to increase exposure, making sure the spirulina gets what it needs to thrive. Finally, oxygen levels are carefully monitored because spirulina needs plenty of oxygen for cellular respiration. If oxygen levels drop, air pumps or aerators are used to boost it. Paddle wheels also keep the water moving, ensuring the spirulina stays well oxygenated and evenly distributed in the tank. Keeping everything in balance helps ensure healthy, productive spirulina. When the water turns a deep green and gets thick with algae, it's a clear sign that the spirulina is ready to be harvested. But to be sure, modern tools are often used to double check. For example, a spectrophotometer measures how much light the water absorbs, helping gauge the density of the spirulina. Another tool, the Secchi disk, checks water clarity. If the water's less clear, it means the spirulina concentration is higher. Of course, many farmers still trust their eyes, using the deep green color and thickness as a reliable indicator that it's time to harvest. When spirulina reaches the right concentration, 0.4 to 0.8 grams of dry powder per liter, it's ready to be harvested. This usually occurs within two to three weeks of cultivation. There are different methods for separating spirulina from the water, such as filtration, centrifugation, and flocculation and flotation. Each method varies in speed and energy use, depending on the scale of production. Let's look into the harvesting process. Before harvesting starts, they make sure everything is ready before harvesting spirulina to keep the process smooth and efficient. Pumps are used to move the spirulina from the growing system to the harvesting area. Filters then separate the spirulina from the liquid, collecting the concentrated algae. For even more precision, spinners spin the mixture, separating the spirulina cells from the liquid. Everything is thoroughly sanitized beforehand to make sure the final product is clean and safe. The harvesting process starts with separating the biomass or algae. And there are two main methods to do this, filtration and centrifugation. In filtration, the spirulina mixture is pumped through a vibrating filter or membrane system. This filter separates the spirulina, called a slurry, from the water. One advantage of this method is that the filtered water can often be returned to the cultivation system, making it very efficient and eco-friendly by reducing water waste. Centrifugation, on the other hand, uses rapid spinning to create a strong centrifugal force that separates the spirulina from the water much faster than filtration. This method is highly efficient in terms of speed and is commonly used in larger operations that need to process large volumes quickly. It can also produce a higher concentration of spirulina. Both methods have their place, and the choice depends on the scale of the production and the balance between speed and energy use. Once the spirulina slurry is collected, the next step is concentration or getting rid of the excess water. This is usually done by pressing the slurry until it thickens up to a dough-like texture. Reducing the water content makes the spirulina more concentrated, which makes it much easier to handle and process. Plus, with less water, it's simpler to dry and package, and it helps preserve the spirulina's nutrients for longer storage. This step is super important because it sets the stage for turning the spirulina into powders, flakes, or supplements, making it ready for the next part of its journey. After the spirulina has been concentrated, the next step is extrusion using a machine called an extruder. The extruder shapes the spirulina into long noodles or strips. This specific shape is important because it increases the surface area, allowing the spirulina to dry faster and more efficiently. By forming it into these shapes, 
the drying process becomes quicker, ensuring the spirulina retains its quality while being easier to handle in the next steps of production. Once the spirulina noodles are formed, it's time for drying them out and remove any leftover moisture. There are two methods to do this. Low temperature drying. This method uses gentle heat, usually around 40 to 50 degrees Celsius, to carefully dry the spirulina while keeping most of its nutrients intact. It's great for preserving the quality and making sure the spirulina doesn't spoil. Spray drying. For bigger operations, spray drying is often the go-to. It dries the spirulina quickly, but since it uses higher temperatures, sometimes over 100 degrees Celsius, it can cause a bit of nutrient loss. It's fast and efficient for large-scale production, though it may sacrifice some nutritional value in the process. After the spirulina has been dried, it's time for milling. This step uses specialized equipment, such as hammer mills or ball mills, to grind the dried spirulina into smaller pieces or a fine powder. Milling not only makes the spirulina easier to package and handle, but also prepares it for use in products like supplements or food additives. This ensures the spirulina is in the perfect form for its next stage of production. At every stage of harvesting and processing, quality control is key. Regular tests are done to make sure the spirulina is pure, free from any contaminants, and meets all safety standards. This way, you can be sure the final product is clean and high quality. Once the spirulina passes all the quality checks, it's carefully packaged in moisture-proof containers. This packaging protects it from light and humidity, which helps keep the spirulina fresh and full of nutrients. Now that spirulina has been harvested and processed, it's ready for a wide range of applications across different industries. It's a superfood packed with nutrients, so you'll find it in supplements like powders and capsules. It's also used in food products like smoothies and energy bars for a healthy boost. Spirulina even makes its way into animal feed, helping livestock grow healthier. In the beauty world, it's popular in skincare products thanks to its antioxidant benefits for glowing, healthy skin. It's remarkable how modern technology has revolutionized spirulina farming, turning it into a highly efficient and sustainable practice. From controlled cultivation environments to advanced harvesting techniques, spirulina transitions from a simple algae to a versatile superfood used in a wide range of industries. The integration of innovations like photobioreactors highlights the future of farming and its potential to enhance both productivity and environmental sustainability. If you found this insight into spirulina farming valuable, we invite you to explore more content on innovative farming practices and sustainability. Thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you in our next video.